Welcome again to our midweek devotion in the series that we've been doing on the Lord's Prayer. Let's begin with prayer. Oh Lord, how wonderful it is to meet again. How wonderful to hear this wonderful prayer that you taught us, how, how sweet to pray it. And now, Lord, as we open your word and look at what you have to say to us there, open our hearts that we may receive these things and believe them. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of God Most High, my dear family in Christ, the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer is, and lead us not into temptation. We've all said that for a lot of years, ever since we, we learned this prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, but hasn't that petition seemed somewhat strange to you? Asking God, lead us not into temptation. And James 1, 13 tells us, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, because God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. And yet Jesus taught us to pray to our Father in heaven, and lead us not into temptation. Are we asking God to not do what he promises to not do? Let's talk about temptation. It's everywhere, isn't it? As a matter of fact, there's no way we get away from it. Our Lord Jesus said in Luke 17, temptations are sure to come. How true we know that is as we live in this fallen world. We cannot get away from temptations. They're everywhere we look, but that does not mean that we have to give in. Maybe you are familiar with the old adage, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. I hope that's pretty transparent. Well, let's go back to James where he said, let no one say when he is tempted, God is tempting me. He goes on to say, each person is tempted when he is dragged away and enticed by his own desire. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Do you recall the Bible history of Joseph and Mrs. Potiphar in Genesis 39? Remember, Joseph had been sold into slavery in Egypt. He ends up in the employ, under the ownership, of Potiphar. And Mrs. Potiphar, the Bible says, noticed Joseph. She did more than notice him. She wanted him. And the Bible says that day after day, she was enticing him. She kept on saying to him, go to bed with me. And Joseph refused. In fact, he said to her, Look, my master does not con concern himself with anything that has been entrusted to me, and he has not withheld anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a great evil and sin against God? Good answer, isn't it? But it didn't even slow Mrs. Potiphar down. She kept on enticing him. She kept on trying to seduce him into satisfying what is arguably a very intense urge. Finally, the day came when only she and Joseph were in the house. And this time it says she grabbed him by his outer cloak. She intended to drag him into this temptation if she could. And when she would not let loose, the Bible says Joseph left his coat in her hand and ran out of the house. Mrs. Potiphar was angry. And in her anger, she accused Joseph falsely of attempting to rape her. But even in the face of those accusations and what it would mean for Joseph, Joseph would not give in. Well, I imagine that Joseph was truly tempted. He was as sinful a man as anybody else. We do know, at least the Bible intimates to us, that he had sexual urges. He did marry. He did have children. But there are others in the Bible that we meet that did, did give in to that temptation. Do you know the story of Judah? It's not a very nice story. The story of Judah's giving in is that he saw a woman and he ends up sleeping with her. She ends up being his daughter-in-law. Now, it seemed okay to him at the time because she's dressed up like a prostitute. Yeah, like that makes it okay. Or how about David and Bathsheba? David took another man's wife. Neither of these men resisted the temptation. Both of them were dragged away and enticed by their own sinful desires. Proverbs chapter 6 warns us, Whoever commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. We go back to James. Because James said there, And sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. Oh yeah, sin can lead to physical death, but it can lead to something much worse. It can lead, when we give in to temptation, we are on the road to the death of faith. And worse than that, if that occurs, we are in the road 
to eternal death in hell. There are all kinds of temptations, aren't there? Temptations to laziness, to greed, to lust. Temptations to the misuse of God's wonderful gifts. We could misuse alcohol or drugs by abusing them or overusing them. How about the temptation to believe parts of God's word that sound okay to us, but to reject those that our culture rejects or that our own sinful choices reject? And how about the very serious temptation? That once we have fallen to believe that maybe God won't take me back this time. Maybe this time he's going to write me off and say no. So let's define temptation this way. Let's define it as any situation into which a person can come to where he could be led astray. Into false belief, despair, or great and shameful sins. Well, here's the elementary question. Where does temptation come from? Well, the easiest answer is the devil, isn't it? In Revelation 12, verse 9, we hear this. The great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, the one called the devil and Satan, the one who leads the whole inhabited world astray. Jesus said about him in John 8, He was a murderer from the beginning and did not remain standing in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and the father of lies. Understand, the devil knows the truth. He knows how to spin the truth. He knows how to tell just enough truth to make his lies sound so sweet. Think about the way that he tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said to Eve, Oh, you know, this, this tree that God said is, is off limits here. Look at the fruit, Eve. Doesn't it look good? Mm, looks good. Looks good for food. And God knows that when you eat of it, you'll be like him knowing, interesting choice of word because it means to know by experience, knowing both good and evil. God experienced evil when the devil rebelled. And God's reaction was not to fall for any temptation there, but to drum the devil out of the angel core and to kick him out of heaven. People experienced evil when they fell for the temptation and brought the curse of sin upon themselves. How about another source of temptation? How about the, the sinful world all around us, its influences, its peer pressure, its coercion? God's Word tells us in 1 John chapter 2, Do not love the world or, in, or the things in the world, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the boasting about material possessions, <clears throat> is not from the Father, but from the world. Have you ever noticed how good things how the world can twist those into temptation. Let's take one near and dear to my heart. How about food? Food's a good thing, right? It is a good thing. But look how we can get really twisted into some temptations there. How about too much of something that's not exactly good for us? If only French fries, uh, let me put it a different way. If only broccoli tasted like French fries. If only they tasted like candy bars. Maybe I would eat more of it. Or maybe it's the temptation to eat too much, or let's go the other way. Maybe the temptation is to look like that picture I see on the wall, and maybe I eat not at all, or much less than my body needs. How about the beauty of nature that's still left even in this fallen world? And yet I've heard people say, that's my church, that's my cathedral. I feel so much closer to God out in nature. Away from the Word, away from God's Word and sacraments, the real food for our souls. How about family? A wonderful gift from God is family. And yet I've heard people say to me, I can't be a part of church and I really can't be open about my faith because it will break my family apart. How about protecting people that are being bullied? Is that a good thing? Absolutely a good thing. God says protect those who cannot protect themselves. It is good to step in no matter why that person is being bullied. But the world says, okay, if you're going to do that, great. But then you also have to protect their sinful choices. How twisted. And then we have a third source, source of temptation, our own sinful natures. Something the Bible sometimes refers to as our sinful flesh. 2 Peter 2.18, in talking about people who lead others astray, says this, For by uttering arrogant, empty words... They use the depraved lusts of the flesh to seduce those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. You know it. You have lived it. You felt it. I 
have the desire to do what God has forbidden and to not do what he has commanded. Can you relate? The devil knows that and he exploits it. The world intuits it. And by ourselves, we are an easy mark for temptation. Concupiscence. Those of you who know me have heard that word before. It's a really, really fancy word. You know what it means. It means that each of us has a totally fallen nature and a well-developed desire to sin. That's why we cry out with the Apostle Paul, What a wretched human being I am! Who will save me from this body of death? But as our dear Lord shows us, there is a beautiful answer to that outcry. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. How precious is that answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why is that so precious? Think about what we learn in Hebrews chapter 4. It's in verse 15. Talking about Jesus there it says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Does Jesus know the temptation you are facing? He knows every one of them, in every way just as we are, but was without sin. He always answered temptation correctly. Good for Jesus, right? Good for you. The Bible tells us that God takes Jesus' perfect obedience and credits that to you because he has brought you into a faith relationship with him. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 is one of the most precious verses in the Bible to me. There it says, God made him who did not know sin. Jesus had no relationship with sin to become sin for us, and he did it at the cross. He became your sin, my sin, at the cross, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is the Lord our righteousness. Jesus is the reason God forgives you. Jesus is the reason that God looks at you and he has said, now you are without sin because Jesus paid for it. Jesus is the reason that one day you and I are going to be totally free from temptation when God welcomes us home to heaven. So then for what are we praying when we address our Father in heaven and say, and lead us not into temptation? Well, C.S. Lewis said there are basically two kinds of people in the world. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those who so reject God and his ways that God finally has to say to them, thy will be done. You know that's biblical. It's based on Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 says that people can get to the point where they deny God as the creator. Well, let's put it in modern terms or semi-modern, that they would become Darwinists that they no longer believe in a God who created the world in six 24-hour days, that they no longer believe that he sustains things. Oh, maybe he made the Big Bang and then walked away from it. That's not what the Bible says. That leads to horrible corruption. It says for that for those who have denied God's creation and his sustaining of creation, for this reason, God handed them over to disgraceful passions. And there he includes sexual sins of all kinds, including both male and female homosexuality, and all kinds of things that destroy families and society itself. And God gave them over, it says, to a corrupted mind to do things that should never be done. And lead us not into temptation. We're asking God, don't give me over to my temptations and my sins. Use your law to, to haul me back, to show me where I am wrong. Correct me, Lord. And then rescue me. Rescue me as you give me your gospel that in Jesus I find forgiveness. Lord, help me to believe that I have what I prayed for in the fifth petition when I beg you forgive me my trespasses. Next, when we pray and lead us not into temptation, we're praying that God would give us the victory over temptation, over despair, over doubt. Do you know God has guaranteed you that? He says to you in Romans chapter 8, In all these things... We are, present tense, more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powerful forces, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Well, that brings us to our 
Catechism Corner, that wonderful little book that says at the heading of each section, as the head of the household should teach these basics of God's word to the members of his household. The sixth petition, lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? God surely tempts no one to sin. But we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh may not deceive us or lead us into false belief or despair or great and shameful sins. And though we are tempted by them, we pray that we may overcome and win the victory. Amen. Well, now that we've heard these things on the Lord's Prayer, let's go to our Father in Heaven with the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord, let me put it the old way, lift up his countenance on you. It means to look at you with favor and give you peace.